I uh, arrived here Sunday night uh, after a bit of a delay uh, in, in Washington to attend the parallel conference of the OSCE meeting that's taking place here today. And it's also been an opportunity to meet with a number of Belarusians who are here in Vilnius, as well as some who have come from Belarus to attend this conference here today and, and yesterday. Some of them, in fact, uh, were meeting with uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton before we arrived here this morning. And so it's a great opportunity for the Secretary of State to hear from a number of your colleagues who are actively involved in civil society. And this is a great opportunity for me to reconnect. Um, I've been following developments in Belarus for a number of years. I worked in the U.S. government and the Department of State for eight years, and one of the positions I held was as Deputy Assistant Secretary responsible for dealing with Belarus as well as Russia, Ukraine, and Moldova. And in that position, um, I was part of the U.S. government effort to win the release of political prisoners in 2008. I went to Minsk several times uh, to try to convince the government to release the political prisoners in 2006 and 2007. And unfortunately, April 2007 was the last time I was allowed in Belarus. Um, I have not been given a visa since then, even after I've left the US government. And so um, I very much hope that uh, not too far in the future, we can have this kind of discussion and meeting inside Belarus um, in a Belarus that is more free and democratic and a government that respects human rights. And I very much look forward to that day, as I say, that I hope will be very soon. Um, I left the US government in January of 2009. I initially worked at the German Marshall Fund in Washington and I continued to focus on Belarus there. The German Marshall Fund does some very good work on Belarus. Pavel Demish and Jörg Freuberg, if you know their names, are actively involved in Belarus. Um, and then I joined Freedom House in October of last year as the president of Freedom House. It's an organization that just recently celebrated its 70th anniversary. It started in 1941 to deal with a number of isms, as I call them. There was the challenge of fascism and Nazism and communism, but also there was the challenge of isolationism that was growing in the United States at that time. A sense in, in many circles in the US Congress and elsewhere that the United States didn't want to have anything to do with what was happening in Europe, to try to wall ourselves off and separate ourselves and, and fortunately, there were enough sane minds, including President Roosevelt, who understood that we could not separate ourselves from what was happening in Europe. And of course, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor uh, made that whole discussion a moot point. So it was from there that Freedom House was established to promote and support the advancement of freedom around the world, democracy, and human rights. And so we have been engaged in that kind of work for seven decades. We do this through a number of different ways. We produce several reports, including one called Freedom in the World, which we've been publishing since 1972. And in this report, we rank countries as to whether they are free, partly free, or not free. And in fact, we'll, we'll bring some maps, send some maps to you so that you have them. Um, where we color code countries based on their rankings. Um, we also produce reports on freedom of the press, freedom of the net, freedom of the internet, um, as well as a special report called Nations in Transit, which focuses on countries in this region. We do some special reports too, including one that I was involved in uh, that we produced, that Freedom House produced together with the Center for European Policy Analysis that focused on Belarus in particular and offered a, a framework for trying to promote 
greater freedom and, and human rights and, and democracy in Belarus. Beyond these reports, we also have programs in countries around the world where we support civil society activists, support human rights defenders, and act as a liaison in many cases between civil society and governments. And we operate in the Middle East. I've traveled to Cairo three times, both before and since the Arab Spring. We, op we operate programs in Africa, in Latin America, Asia, and elsewhere. Um, and I'm very pleased, as you may know, to uh, tell you that we have a very small office, but a very powerful and effective office, thanks to Ella, uh, here in Vilnius that focuses on Belarus. And so we have a specific office devoted to your country um, and how we can help support civil society activists and human rights defenders. The last part is we engage in what's called advocacy, where we try to work with governments and international organizations in making sure that they stay aware of the problems and challenges to freedom around the world. We work with the US Congress, including on trying to help pass the Belarus Democracy Reauthorization Act, which I was involved in when I was in the government before, and which I'm trying to help pass now that I'm out of the government. We also work with the US administration, but also with other governments, including those in the European Union, in trying to make sure that they understand the challenges that exist to freedom and democracy and human rights around the world. So that's a bit of background uh, to uh, my uh, experience, but also to the organization for which I work, which is, I think, one of the finest human rights and democracy organizations around. There are many others that do terrific work as well. I've had an opportunity here just in the past two days to meet with a number of them. Um, but, uh, but Freedom House, I want you to know and be assured, is very much on your side in trying to help support democracy and freedom and human rights in Belarus, as well as elsewhere in the region. Now, um, let me offer a few comments about how I see the situation in Belarus since December 19th. Needless to say, the uh, election and what happened in the immediate aftermath of the election was a disaster. But it frankly should not have been any surprise. I was not one of those who supported engagement as many European officials were trying with the Lukashenko regime after the release of political prisoners in 2008. This regime that we're talking about, the Lukashenko regime, is one that I think is irredeemable. It is not capable of leading Belarus to a better, brighter future. It is not capable of moving Belarus in a democratic direction. It is a thoroughly corrupt regime that is often called the last dictatorship in Europe for good reason. It's a regime that shows no respect for human rights. It's a regime that shows no respect for freedom. It's a regime that shows no respect for freedom of association or expression. And I think what we saw in 2008 and 2009 and even into 2010 was Lukashenko very skillfully playing the West and Russia off of each other. He's brilliant at this. And all too often, the West falls for this trap. And I think that's what happened in the lead up to the elections last year, including offers of some three and a half billion dollars that the Polish and German foreign ministers offered to Lukashenko if the elections were credible. Well, of course, the elections were incredible. But this is Lukashenko. I mean, there's a, there's a long history and track record that should have shown us that what we saw un, unfold and develop last year, last December, was typical and not an exception. And of course, the arrests of some 700 people, including seven out of nine presidential candidates, uh, the beatings of a number of people, torture of some of those who were held in detention, is something for which the European Union and the United States cannot tolerate. And so I think it's been critically important that the West has responded in a forceful way, although I would argue not forcefully enough, in imposing sanctions, including a visa ban, an asset freeze, against officials who are guilty for these kinds of abuses. 
And I have also pushed for the imposition of economic sanctions, economic sanctions against state-owned enterprises, because I think this is the most effective way of punishing Lukashenko and forcing him to, at a minimum, release those who are held in jail for political reasons. And I have argued this based on personal direct experience having pushed for economic sanctions in 2007 and 2008. I traveled to Minsk in April of 2007 when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the State Department and warned officials in Lukashenko's regime that the United States would impose sanctions against state-owned enterprises. I had a rather unexpected meeting with Natalia Petkevich at the time in a coffee shop that was supposed to be secret but didn't stay secret very long, in which I warned her that if the political prisoners were not released, the United States would impose these sanctions. We had already imposed a visa ban and asset freeze for what happened in the 2006 election, but we hadn't yet imposed economic sanctions. And as a result, the political prisoners were still sitting in jail. In November of 2007, after there was still no progress in the release of political prisoners, the United States went ahead and imposed sanctions against Bel Neftekin. Two months later, an official from Lukashenko's regime came to the U.S. Embassy and asked in Minsk and asked, what, was, what would the United States do if Lukashenko were to release the political prisoners? And the embassy came back to Washington, asked for guidance on this, and we sent a response overnight saying we would ease the sanctions if he released the political prisoners. Within 36 hours, the political prisoners started being released. And at this time, there were six political prisoners there became a seventh one because one was thrown in jail during this process. Um, and the expectation was from that time in January 2008 that they would all be out by the end of February. Unfortunately, the German ambassador to Belarus at the time intervened and offered to take Alexander Kazulin and his very ill wife at the time to Germany for essentially what amounted to political asylum. He had never asked Kazulin whether Kazulin wanted to do this. And when Kazulin learned about this, he did not want to go. Moreover, his wife was too sick to go, and sadly she died in March of 2008 after a very courageous struggle with cancer. And so uh, we decided in Washington that Kazulin's release was being delayed, and we warned again that if he was not released, that we would impose further sanctions. We did. We imposed more sanctions. Our ambassador was kicked out of Belarus, Karen Stewart. Um, but several months later, Kazulin eventually was released. The economic sanctions worked. They worked much more effectively than the visa ban and the asset freeze. And they worked, let's be clear, to free political prisoners. They didn't work in bringing about freedom and democracy to Belarus. But they were designed to win the release of people who were in jail. And it's my firm belief that getting people out of jail is a critically important thing. Um, I would argue that the same situation applies now. And I was pleased to see the European Union impose sanctions in June of this year to try to win the release of the political prisoners. But I think more needs to be done, including more sanctions, and there have not been enough sanctions against state-owned enterprises. Remember that, what, 70 to 80 percent of Belarus's economy is in state hands. So we're talking about a situation where sanctions are being imposed that will hurt the regime Hopefully not the average Belarusian, but at a certain point that may happen too. That is an unfortunate consequence, and I don't mean to minimize it. But if you want to get Lukashenko's attention, the way to do it, I would strongly argue, is through economic sanctions. I regret that the United States and the European Union did not impose sanctions against Beltrans gas. Had it done so, 
it is possible that the Russians would not have purchased the remaining 50% of Beltran's gas as it apparently did 10 days ago. This, I think, was a very unfortunate and negative development. And it suggests that Lukashenko is desperately selling out Belarus's assets in the interest of staying in power. What Belarus is facing now, I would argue, is a unique economic crisis for which Lukashenko is responsible. The crisis is not the responsibility of economic sanctions or of the West. This is because Lukashenko irresponsibly increased wages and pensions before the election when the government could not afford to do so. As a result, Belarus has been in a major economic crisis, the worst it has faced since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Lukashenko is desperate. He needs money, and so he's now willing to sell off whatever assets he can in order to stay in power. And so I think that's what we saw 10 days ago when he met with Russian officials and agreed to sell Beltrans gas. As I say, I think this is a very unfortunate development because Beltrans gas is arguably the most important asset that Belarus has. And for the Russians to take it over is a bad development. So I would argue that the West needs to challenge this sale. And Belarusians need to challenge this sale. This was done, obviously, in a very non-transparent fashion. It was not done through any competitive bidding. It was done through a closed, corrupt means with Russian officials so that Lukashenko can stay in power. Now, I would also argue that there are other possibilities where Lukashenko will sell out Belarus assets. And I think it's very important that the European Union and the United States consider economic sanctions against other enterprises so that they become less attractive for potential buyers, whether it's Russians or Chinese or Azerbaijanis or Iranians or anyone else. It's very important to try to preserve the assets and the enterprises that Belarus has before Lukashenko sells them out in order to stay in power. Now, in the report that Freedom House and the Center for European Policy Analysis produced we also very strongly argue for greater engagement with civil society and for the opposition. Civil society is the key to Belarus's future. All of you are the key to Belarus's future as well. And we strongly urge more support, more coordination for civil society efforts, for human rights organizations, as well as for the opposition. Now, I, on the opposition, let me say, I'm not one who believes that we should try to force unity among the opposition. Having tried that in 2006, it didn't work. The opposition is rather disunited. It disagrees on a lot of things. That's not necessarily ideal, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. There's even something democratic about opposition figures disagreeing with each other. And I, I would argue that we don't want to waste our time trying to force artificial unity among the opposition. Instead, as long as the opposition understands that there is a common threat out there, and the threat is represented by Lukashenko, then it seems to me that's OK. The opposition, where I think we can help, needs to offer alternatives. It needs to offer vision. It needs to offer Belarusians a reason why they should vote for them rather than simply against the regime. Now, the regime, of course, has suffered significant decline in popularity. According to some polls, including those by Minayev and his association, Lukashenko's support is down to some 20%. I think this is a major development. It suggests that Belarusians are really losing patience with their leader. And so I, I think there is a real opportunity here. And it's why we issued the report when we did in September. It's on our website if you have not seen it. Is it translated uh, on our website? 
Not yet. We'll try to get a translation of it on our website before too long, because the translation does exist, I believe. So we'll get that posted on our website uh, as well. Um, and, and I would encourage you to, to read the report and also send us comments and feedback and reaction. I, I don't want to stand here and tell you that the report we produced is a perfect product um, that is the last word we have to say on it. To be perfectly honest with you, it was produced by a group of Americans who follow Belarus very closely, with some Europeans, but I'm sorry to say it didn't have any Belarusian input. And so that's obviously an important ingredient to have in this report, and so we would welcome any comments or feedback on the report. But in the report, we do argue um, that there is a critical need to support civil society, to support the opposition forces, to do what we can both here in Vilnius and support organizations and institutions like EHU, um, as well as support organizations and entities inside Belarus itself. It is important to the extent possible to help people inside the country, recognizing that a lot of people don't have the luxury or ability to stay in the and so I think that's why an institution like EHU is so valuable and so important to give you an opportunity to continue your studies and hopefully to be able to return to a Belarus that is moving in a more positive direction. So uh, I, I, I do think that um, Belarus is at a critical stage right now. I think we continue to see the government crack down against dissent, when it's illegal for people to just stand somewhere, whether they're clapping or doing nothing or breathing or engaging in yoga, when a government has to arrest people for doing that, it's a sign that a government's pretty desperate. It's a sign that the government is very insecure. It's a sign that the government is very paranoid. And my hope is to uh, make the government even more insecure and more paranoid, not at the expense of more abuses of human rights, but at the expense of its survival. Now, uh, let me just say a few more words. I, I do think, I, I have a pretty hawkish, hardline position on Belarus. I have for years. But when I was in the government, I supported continuation of the Partnership for Peace with Belarus, which is a, a NATO relationship that NATO has with countries that are not members of NATO. And I felt it was important to maintain these ties with the military so that we do what we can to make sure the military does not get involved in the domestic situation inside your country. I also recognize it is important to have certain ties with certain parts of the government. Because if Lukashenko drops dead tomorrow, people in the, people in the government, I'm getting so excited about that possibility, uh, people inside the government now are going to be there tomorrow. And they will play a role in Belarus's future. So I do think it is important to reach out and engage with certain levels of the government because they will be there in the future. And you will need lawyers and economists and uh, bankers and others to play a role in a post-Lukashenko Belarus. But I would also say that it is very important to start thinking about a post-Lukashenko Belarus. It is never too early to plan for that. And it's not wishful thinking, because he is going to be gone sooner or later. My hope is sooner. And so it's very important for the West to indicate that a post-Lukashenko Belarus will be met with strong engagement and support from the European Union and from the United States, including financial support, but also political support, so that Belarus can feel that after Lukashenko is gone, that the days are brighter and more promising. The last thing any of us would want, I would argue, is for people inside the country to miss Lukashenko. That day when he's gone is a day we should celebrate and not look back and say, boy, those were good days, weren't they? <laughs>
And so um, I, I do want to stop because I want to have time for discussion. Um, but I want you to know that uh, Freedom House, our small presence here in Vilnius, is also uh, an opportunity for you to engage with us. Um, we hope that you'll feed us uh, comments and ideas and suggestions. And I, I also hope that we'll have an opportunity for another uh, time to have this kind of, of meeting. Although I hope the next time we'll be inside Belarus rather than here. No disrespect to our Lithuanian hosts. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, and I really would welcome an opportunity to have a, a conversation with you. Thank you.